Could you use a miracle right now in your life? You know, miracles when God steps in to the natural world and breaks all the rules and does something supernatural, does something so amazing that the only explanation is God did it. Do you need that kind of miracle in your life? I'm Pastor Bill Thomas. I pastor at Hereford Faith and Life Church, and we're going to look at miracles today. I want to share screen with you, and we will be looking at Simeon, the prophet. And it's a great, great uh, message for us today. You know, on Christmas Eve, we wrapped up our Advent series, The Cast of Christmas, and we found that throughout uh, uh, the years, thousands of years, that God used lots and lots of people to produce this epic rescue of the human race. We looked at the prophets, we looked at the angels, we looked at the shepherds and the wise men. Christmas Eve, we looked at our part in this epic saga, and that is to respond yes to Jesus Christ, our great Redeemer, our Savior and Lord who was born. But what often doesn't get the attention it should in the church following Christmas is a dramatic scene that unfolds some 40 days after the birth of Jesus. It's recorded in Luke's gospel immediately following the account of the shepherds on the night Jesus was born. Luke chapter 2, starting in verse 21, let me read it for you. On the eighth day, when it was time to circumcise the child, he was named Jesus, the name the angel had given him before he was conceived. And when the time came for the purification rites required by the law of Moses, Joseph and Mary took him to Jerusalem to present him to the Lord, as it is written in the law of the Lord, every firstborn male is to be consecrated to the Lord. And to offer a sacrifice in keeping with what is said in the law of the Lord, a pair of doves or two young pigeons. Now there was a man in Jerusalem called Simeon, who was righteous and devout. He was waiting for the consolation of Israel, and the Holy Spirit was on him. It had been revealed to him by the Holy Spirit that he would not die before he had seen the Lord's Messiah. Moved by the Spirit, he went into the temple courts. And when the parents brought in the child Jesus to do for him what the custom of the law required, Simeon took him in his arms and praised God, saying, Sovereign Lord, you have promised. You may now dismiss your servant in peace. For my eyes have seen your salvation, which you have prepared in the sight of all nations, a light for revelation to the Gentiles. Let's read this part again, because this is really, really important. Let's read it together. There was a man in Jerusalem called Simeon, who was righteous and devout. He was waiting for the consolation of Israel, and the Holy Spirit was on him. It had been revealed to him by the Holy Spirit that he would not die before he had seen the Lord's Messiah. Moved by the Spirit, he went into the temple courts. When the parents brought in the child Jesus to do for him what the custom of the law required, Simeon took him in his arms and praised God, saying, now read this nice and loud, Sovereign Lord, as you have promised, you may now dismiss your servant in peace. For my eyes have seen your salvation, which you've prepared in the sight of all nations, a light for revelation to the Gentiles and the glory of your people, Israel. It goes on and reads, the child's father and mother marveled at what was said about him. Then Simeon blessed them and said to Mary, his mother, this child is destined to cause the falling and rising of many in Israel and to be a sign that will be spoken against so that the thoughts of many hearts will be revealed and a sword will pierce your own. This miraculous encounter occurs about 40 days after Jesus' birth. Following the law of God found in Leviticus, Joseph and Mary take baby Jesus to Jerusalem to be consecrated and dedicated to the Lord. Leviticus chapter 12, verses 4 and 5 reads, Every firstborn male that opens the womb shall be called holy to the Lord. That means every first child, male child born in a family, had to be brought to the temple in Jerusalem to dedicate that young boy to the Lord at the completion of the mother's purification. As they entered the courts of the temple in Jerusalem, Joseph and Mary, to have a priest perform these rites of Mary's purification and Jesus' consecration, they encounter Simeon. The Bible calls him a devout man, passionate about God and his kingdom, who was believing for a miracle promised by the Holy Spirit, that he would see with his own eyes the Messiah before Simeon's death. 
It was nothing short of a miracle. Simeon had prayed, asking God to do this one thing for him before he died, to see Jesus. And God gave him the miracle he asked for. And what seems to be just an afterthought by Luke following the birth of Jesus, it teaches us three things about miracles. And if you need a miracle in your life, you need to embrace these three truths. Here's the first one. First, you must believe that God is a miracle-working God and still doing miracles today. You must be utterly convinced in your heart of hearts that God is not only able to do the miraculous, I think we all agree on that. He's powerful enough, but he's still working miracles in our world today for you and for me. Many believe that God is powerful enough. He's omnipotent. We know that doctrine. It means he's all-powerful. But there are some who think that he just doesn't work that way anymore, that miracles are very, very rare occurrences, even if they happen at all. So don't expect a miracle in your life. Well, there's at least three reasons for that outlook. First, there's a whole part of the body of Christ. And listen, there are nice, loving Christians who evangelize, share the gospel. And so I'm not throwing stones at them, but they have a doctrine and a belief that miracles stopped after the apostolic church was established and the word of God was complete. I remember my first Bible, uh, study Bible, was called the Stof uh, Schofield Bible. And it's a great study Bible. It's great footnotes and explanations, thing, but it adheres to this doctrine called dispensationalism. Dispensationalism is an approach to biblical interpretation, which states that God uses different means of working with people, particularly Israel and the church, during different periods of history. And dispensationalists believe that when the apostolic period was over and the Bible was complete, that God didn't need to do miracles anymore because miracles in the Gospels were used to prove that Jesus' teachings were true, that these doctrines were true. But now that we had the Bible and its completion, God stopped doing these miracles. And listen, I love these brothers and sisters, and often they are amazing soul winners. They focus on winning the loss to Christ, as we all should, but I think they miss an incredible blessing wrapped up in one of my favorite scriptures. Hebrews 13.8 says this, that Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. See, that means that God hasn't stopped doing miracles. Jesus tells his disciples, he tells us in John chapter 14, 12, truly I tell you, whoever believes in me will do the works I've been doing. And they will do even greater things than these because I'm going to the Father. You see, Jesus is still performing miracles. Micah chapter uh, 3, verse 6. Well, I'm sorry, Malachi chapter 3, verse 6 says, I am the Lord and I do not change. You see, God's still doing miracles. Simon believed God's promise. For years, he trusted the promise of the Holy Spirit, spoke to him. And over 6,000 promises are in the Bible for us. And listen, all we have to do is believe, and God will fulfill his promises. We'll see a miracle. Secondly, there are people, some Christians, that believe God created the universe, but then he sat back somewhere to watch it all unfold. They believe in God, but they believe that he's uninterested in the affairs of this world, much less interested in what's going on in our lives. Que sera, sera, whatever shall be, shall be. Listen, that view of God is so antithetical to who God is and his revelation to us in the scriptures. God cares about you. He knows the number of hairs on our head. He's so concerned with every detail in our life. I love Psalm 139. Let me read some parts of it. Oh, Lord, you've examined my heart. You know everything about me. You know when I sit down or stand up. You know my thoughts even when I'm far away. You see me when I travel and when I rest at home. You know everything I do. You know what I'm going to say even before I say it, Lord. You go before me and follow me. You place your hand of blessing on my head. Such knowledge is too wonderful for me, too great for me to understand. For you made all the delicate inner parts of my body, knit me together in my mother's womb. Thank you for making me so wonderfully complex. Your workmanship is marvelous. How well I know it. You watched me as I was being formed in utter seclusion 
as I was woven together in the dark of the womb. You saw me before I was born. Every day of my life was recorded in your book. Every moment laid out before a single day had passed. How precious are your thoughts about me, O God. They cannot be numbered. I can't even count them. They outnumber the grains of sand. Listen, do you, do you still doubt that God cares about you? That God knows you? He's interested in you? That sure doesn't sound like a God who's uninterested, who doesn't get involved. He does. And he cares about you and every need that you have. That's why Peter writes in his epistle, 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 7, give all your worries and cares to God for he cares about you. And then thirdly, some people feel that God's just too busy with bigger things happening in the world to answer our prayers for a miracle. Numerous people, including Christians, have said that to me. Look, Bill, Pat, God's got bigger things concerned, bigger concerns you know, than, than my problems. And if that's what you believe, then your God is too small. That's just a cop out. God is big enough and powerful enough to answer every single person's prayers. Now, I recommend you don't start off praying for big, big things. You start off praying and believing God for small things. Any of you pray for a parking place? Listen, that's okay. In your early days, God will do that just to build your faith. How about healing? Pray for healing for, from colds, right? Have you ever prayed to help find a, a lost object? Learn, learn to trust and expect God to act in everyday things. So listen, when something big comes, your faith muscles are in shape. You can believe God for the miraculous. Henry Blackaby, who wrote the, the uh, seminar, Experiencing God, and a book with it, I highly recommend it. He wrote this, we can become practical atheists, believing that God can perform miracles, but never expecting a miracle in our life. Let me read that again. It's powerful. We can become practical atheists, believing that God can perform miracles, but never expecting a miracle in our life. So first, you must believe God is still in the miracle business today. Second, you must ask. You must ask for your miracle. You, in order to see a miracle, you have to be bold enough to ask for one. James chapter 4, verse 2 says, you don't have what you want because you don't ask God for it. It's as simple as that. You're not experiencing a miracle because you haven't asked God for one. You haven't prayed and asked for a miracle. The number one reason our prayers aren't answered is we never prayed in the first place. We don't pray. You can't have answered prayers to prayers you haven't prayed. Now, how and why would God answer our prayers when we ask him if we don't rely on him in prayer? For most of us, prayer becomes our last option. I can't tell you how many times I've been in situations and meetings where someone said, well, we've done everything humanly possible. I guess the only thing left we can do is pray. <laughs> People, prayer is the first thing we should do. Well, why don't we do that? Why don't we pray? We don't pray sometimes because we think we can handle the situation ourselves. Hey, we're smart enough. We're rich enough. We have doctors and medicines. And hey, above all, we have Google to help us in all our needs. <laughs> I'm laughing because, well, as Dr. Phil on TV would say, and how's that working for you? <laughs> it doesn't work, does it? Listen, you're a child of the living God. And God wants us to depend upon him for everything. And I mean everything. Philippians chapter 4, 6 says, Do not be anxious about anything, but in every situation, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your requests to God. I've shared this before with you and my congregation, but I used to have an old, old car. It was my first car. In fact, I lived in it with my extra semester at college. It was a Pontiac station wagon and oh, it had over 200,000 miles on it when I bought it, which tells you a lot. I don't know anything about cars. But my old car, we, we, uh, I married my wife, Linda, and, and that was our car. And before we went anywhere, Linda and I would pray over that car. We would just get in there and say, Lord, bless this car, help us get to wherever we're going safely and 
just keep the engine running. And Lord, we thank you. We're going to trust you for that. And we used to do that prayer everywhere we went. We had to pray for our car. It needed prayer. But guess what? Eventually, we made enough money and we bought a new car. And guess what? I stopped praying. You don't have to pray over a new car. I mean, it comes with a warranty and everything. So listen, don't do that in your life. Pray every time, whether you got an old car or a new car, in every circumstance and situation, by prayer and petition, present your request to God. Some people tell, tell me, well, well, God knows what I need. I, I shouldn't have to ask. Well, is that how you like your kids to act? Listen, God's our heavenly father. He loves when his kids come to him for help and guidance and comfort. Matthew chapter 6, verse 7, Jesus says, And when you're praying, do not use meaningless, meaningless repetition as the Gentiles do, for they suppose that their prayers will be heard for their many words. So do not be like them, for your Father knows what you need before you ask him. Pray then in this way. And then Jesus teaches them the Lord's Prayer. So Jesus acknowledges, yes, God the Father knows what we need before we ask. But then he goes on and teaches the disciples how to pray. What Jesus is saying is that God loves to hear our prayers. And he loves even more to answer our prayers. So first, believe that God performs miracles today. He does. Second, ask God for a miracle. Pray about it. And third, we need to trust God to act. We need to trust God. We need to wait with faith and perseverance and with the anticipation and expectation that God has already answered our prayer. And now it's up to his timing to manifest his miracle. You see, faith is believing what we have prayed for will come to pass. Mark chapter 11, verse 24 says, Therefore I tell you, whatever you ask in prayer, believe that you have received it, and it will be yours. Jesus said that. I didn't make it up. Whatever you ask for in prayer, believe that you've received it. Not that you will, but you already have, and it will be yours. See, faith is believing you have what you prayed for, that God will do it. To the extent that you can begin to thank God and trust God for his perfect timing to have the answer manifest itself to you. Here's a kingdom principle. First, the supernatural than the natural. This is a great description. There's a great description of this truth, why God answers our prayers and our miracles can be delayed in the 10th chapter of Daniel. Daniel is given a vision, but he can't interpret it. And so what does he do? He prays. In fact, he prays and he fasts and he cries out to God for three full weeks. Imagine going without food for three weeks. He fasts. And then an angel comes to him to give him the answer. Now listen, to what the angel says. He said, Daniel, you are highly esteemed. Consider carefully the words I'm about to speak to you and stand up for I have been now been sent to you. And then when he said this to me, I stood up trembling. Then the angel continued, do not be afraid, Daniel, since the first day that you set your mind to gain understanding and to humble yourself before your God, your words were heard and I've come in response to them. But the prince of the Persian kingdom resisted me 21 days. Then Michael, one of the chief princes, came to help me because I was detained there with the king of Persia. And now I've come to explain to you what will happen to your people in the future, for this vision concerns a time yet to come. So what's the angel explaining here? He's telling Daniel, he says, listen, God heard your prayer the very first day, the moment you spoke your prayer. God not only heard, but he began to answer immediately by sending the angel. But there was a battle in the heavenly realms, in the supernatural realm for 21 days, holding up the answer. And if it hadn't been for Michael, the archangel, he might've still been battling. When we pray, God moves and heaven is unleashed. Oftentimes there's a battle in the unseen world and we must continue to pray stand fast in our request and believe and trust that God's not only moved, but he already has. He's already heard and answered. See, faith is believing 
before seeing. We get it all turned around. We say, I believe it when I see it. We are to persevere and stand in faith, even when the circumstances look impossible. That's when the word of God helps us stand, helps us trust. When we see what appears to be impossible, God's word says, but with God, nothing's impossible. I know a famous pastor who went through his dictionary and with an exacto knife, cut out the word impossible. It's not in his dictionary anymore. He didn't want to see it. And he doesn't use it in his vocabulary because with all things are possible with God. So Simeon shows us these three amazing truths. He believed God is and was a miracle-working God. And people, God has not changed. He is the exact same yesterday, today, and forever. And he's still doing miracles. And then he asked God for his miracles. He prayed. He prayed that God would allow him to see the Messiah before Simeon would die. And then thirdly, he trusted God. We don't know how many years happened between that promise of the Holy Spirit when God answered his prayer and when he answered that prayer with the miracle. But we do see that Simeon never stopped believing. He waited patiently. He understood that God had answered. He would wait now to see the manifestation of this miracle. He knew that with God's perfect timing and without giving up or giving in to the circumstances around him, he would see his miracle, and he did. So before we end, I thought what we do is let's pray for a miracle. Let's put what Simon, uh, Simeon has taught us in God's word into practice, all right? Jesus said, blessed be if you not just hearers of the word, but be doers of the word. So let's, let's put this to practice. So if you would, think about the miracle you need in your life. Not so much what you want, but what do you really need? What, what, what are you crying out to God? And let's just pray and trust God. Are you ready? Just repeat after me. Heavenly Father, we come to you in the mighty and powerful and wonderful name of Jesus Christ. We believe that nothing is impossible to you. And that you, O oh God, are the same yesterday, today, and forever. Father, we ask for a miracle. We ask you, and now fill in the blank here with the miracle that you want to happen in your life. Maybe it's breaking an addiction. Maybe it's the salvation of a loved one. Maybe it's for provision. Whatever that miracle is that you need, ask. We ask you that you would do this miracle. Go ahead. Whatever you need, just ask God right now. Lord, I need this miracle. All right, let's keep praying. Lord, we believe with all our hearts that you have heard our prayer. And even now, you are answering. We will trust you to answer our prayer while we wait with hopeful anticipation and expectation that in your perfect timing and for your glory, we will see the manifestation of what's happening supernaturally in the natural realm. And Father, we won't wait until we see it with our eyes and experience it in the natural to praise and thank you. We will do it now. Thank you, God. We praise you, O oh God, for answering the prayers of your children and especially my prayers. For I ask this in the mighty name of Jesus Christ, Amen and amen. Well, I am excited. And I hope that when God brings that miracle into your life and you see the manifestation of it, I want you to write me. Go to our website, www.herefordumc.com 
and uh, my emails there. Just let us know what God is doing, what miracle God did in your life. Healing, health, provision, salvation for love, whatever it is. We want to hear that. It builds our faith and trust too, especially for those who are waiting a long time for that manifestation. Let me pray with you now as we leave this uh, teaching time together. Lord, thank you for this group of folks who are watching from all over, uh, some in Europe, uh, many states, and right here in Maryland. We thank you, God, uh, for my own church family that's watching. Lord, we pray that you would continue to pour out your power, continue to pour out your miraculous power in our lives and in our churches. For God, that's what we know this country needs. It's what our world needs. It's a visible expression of the wonder and beauty and power of the Lord Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior, and chief pastor, shepherd of his church. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. Well, God bless you. Hope you had a great Christmas and you're going to have a great new year ahead. And uh, again, continue uh, to watch. We are blessed by that. And we just pray again that uh, God would give you his peace that passes understanding. And I want to hear, well, I want to hear about the miracles that God is going to do and doing has done in your lives because of that prayer of faith. All right. Keep believing, keep trusting, right? Believe that God is a miracle working God. He is, he's the same yesterday, today, and forever, right? And, uh, and ask, right? It doesn't happen unless you ask. You've got to pray and then believe, right? You've got to trust God that God has already answered and you begin to praise him and thank him. Believing is seeing, right? Believe it and then you'll see it. So just keep on pressing in. God will do it. He's faithful. There's over 6,000 promises in the Bible and you can bet your hat. One of those promises is for you and he's gonna fulfill it just as he did for Simeon. God bless you. Merry Christmas and Happy New Year.